Hi, this is Kirk Weedman, and I'd like to share a study with you. I've titled it, Does Dancing Have a Place in the Worship of God? There seems to be a lot of confusion about worship, and particularly dancing. I hear Christians of almost every denomination and faith proclaiming that David danced in the sanctuary, and that we should too. Does this please God? Does he want us to dance before him in our worship services? Can we give a clear reason for our belief from the Bible? Let's open our Bibles and take a look at this topic that's affecting most Christians today. First, let's quickly go through most of the Old Testament dance verses to refresh ourselves with them before we get into the study. In Exodus 15:20, we see Miriam and other women dancing for joy with tambourines and singing praises to God for the Exodus redemption. In Exodus 32:19, we see the Israelites dancing around the golden calf. In Judges 11.34, Jephthah's daughter greeted him with joy expressed in dancing with tambourines. In Judges 21.21-23, the Benjamites were given a plan to catch wives for themselves from the daughters of Shiloh by taking those women who take part in the dances. In 1 Samuel 18.6, it says that when David returned from killing Goliath, that the women came out of all the cities of Israel, singing and dancing, to meet, the, to meet King Saul with tabrets, with joy, and with instruments of music. 1 Samuel 30.16 says that David defeated the unsuspecting Amalekites as they were eating, drinking, and dancing. 2 Samuel 6.14-16 and 1 Chronicles 15.28-29 tells us that as the Ark of the Covenant was brought to Jerusalem, King David was dancing and leaping for joy before the Lord with all his might, with the sound of musical instruments. It should be noted that, although dancing was an important aspect of Hebrew culture, the Old Testament contains no instances of dancing in the actual tabernacle or temple worship services. We read of dancing prior to the Ark of the Covenant being placed in the tabernacle, but we read nothing of the dancing continuing during the worship service itself. In Ecclesiastes 3.4, King Solomon says, There is a time to mourn and a time to dance. In Jeremiah 31.4-13, we see the prophet Jeremiah prophesied that under the new covenant, God would turn the mourning of his covenant people into joy, that he would rebuild them into greatness and holiness. He prophesied that under the new covenant in Christ, his virgin people would take the tambourine and go forth in the dances of them that make merry. And in Lamentations 5.15, Jeremiah laments over Israel's apostasy, saying that the joy of our heart is ceased, our dance is turned into mourning. In Psalms 30.11 and 12, we read, Thou hast turned for me my mourning into dancing. Thou hast put off my sackcloth and girded me with gladness, to the end that I may sing, that my glory may sing praise to thee and not be silent. In Psalms 149.3, it says, Let them praise his name in the dance. Let them sing praises unto him with the timbrel and harp. And in Psalms 154, it says, Praise him with the timbrel and dance. Praise him with stringed in instruments and organs. Those of you that don't dance in church may be feeling a bit uneasy right now as to how to explain some of these dance texts and how they apply to us as Christians. You shouldn't feel uneasy, and hopefully by the end of this presentation, you will have a good biblical basis as to why we shouldn't be dancing in the house of the Lord. Those of you that do dance and think it's okay, I want to challenge you to listen to the rest of this presentation and discover the meaning of Psalms 149 and 150. Before I continue this presentation, I want to give you a quick hint as to why these two texts are tripping up Christians. Do you remember being a child or maybe hearing other children make statements to other children about how Isaac's wife, Rebecca, smoked camel, camel cigarettes because the Bible says in Genesis chapter 24 verse 64 that she lighted off the camel? Or what about King David played tennis because the Bible says then he brought David to Saul, and David served in the courts as before. Or maybe you heard the statement that Christians carpooled in a Honda because the Bible says, All these with one accord continued. 
We recognize this as something children do to make a joke. The children know what it is they're doing and realize it's not the complete truth, that some of the context of the statement is being left out. Atheists and non-Christians do a similar thing by picking a verse or two out of context, and then they mock Christians about the Bible. But what's really amazing to me is that adult Christians, knowing that the children are doing this as a joke, turn right around and do the very same thing seriously with their Bibles. Adult Christians should know that we don't just pick a verse or two and declare it to be the gospel truth without looking at the context of the surrounding verses and chapters. This is what's happening today with the verses picked in Psalms 149 and 150, as well as with many other verses. Now, let's begin to look more fully at the context of these dance verses. To answer the question about dancing, we need to have a clear understanding of the hermeneutics of the Psalms. Hermeneutics simply means the correct interpretive principles for understanding the Bible. First of all, the book of Psalms was written as poetry, and therefore it must be interpreted in terms of the distinctives of Hebrew poetry, which are basically three. Strong imagery, hyperbole, and the use of parallelisms. Imagery is a verbal picture by means of metaphors, similes, and other figures of speech. Hyperbole is exaggeration for the sake of emphasis. Parallelism describes the heart of Hebrew poetry. Usually two sentences of approximately the same length corresponding to each other in some way. The relationship between the two sentences is basic to understanding the parallelism. We'll take a look at an example in just a little while. With reference to our subject of dancing, we must understand the metaphors, images, and symbolism of the ancient Hebrews without reading back into them our modern interpretations. Think about this. Imagine yourself to be hearing the psalm for the first time when it was originally composed. We need to learn, for instance, what were the customs of the shepherds in the ancient Near East. It's important for us today to realize that the imagery of the Psalter is quite foreign to us. Second, we need to ask ourselves how the first readers of the psalm would have understood the imagery in their time. We should also remember that because Hebrew poetry is full of metaphors and imagery, it must not be interpreted with an exact literalism. For example, when Psalms 91 verse 4 says that God shall cover us with his feathers, this doesn't mean that God is a bird with wings. Let's look at Psalms 149 verses 6 through 9 where it says, Let the high praises of God be in their mouth and a two-edged sword in their hand to execute vengeance upon the heathen and punishments upon the people, to bind their kings with chains and their nobles with fetters of iron, to execute upon them the judgment written. This honor have all his saints, praise ye the Lord. Does this mean we're to come to church and praise God and then take a literal sword and kill the wicked and bind up our government officials? Of course not. Psalms 98.8 says, Let the floods clap their hands. Let the hills be joyful together. Is that literal? I hope you get the point. Therefore, any commands or exhortations in the Psalms must be interpreted according to the poetic genre of the psalm and not as we would interpret the Mosaic legislation or historical narrative. Furthermore, recognizing the parallelisms of poetry of the Psalms is a great help in interpreting the Psalms accurately. For example, the parallelisms of Psalms 30 verse 11 is full of metaphors. Let's look at it. Thou hast turned for me my mourning into dancing. Thou hast put off my sackcloth and girded me with gladness. Throughout this psalm, David is praising God for his help in enabling him to escape from his enemies, so that he will spend the rest of his life praising him. In the words of verse 11, David tells us that, While he was being persecuted, although he trusted in the Lord, nevertheless he experienced heaviness of heart and great sorrow. 2 Corinthians 7.10 tells us this sorrow was of a godly kind, for it moved David to repentance, and to testify of his repentance, he clothed himself in sackcloth. It was the practice of ancient Israel when mourning to dress in rough and unattractive sackcloth. 
made of the hair of animals, often with ashes placed on the head, to testify in these clothes of penitence the intensity of their grief or conviction of sin or both. By the grace of God and through faith in him, God delivered David not only from his persecutors, but also from his grief and heaviness of heart. God changed his mourning into gladness. But we should notice the unforgettable way our parallelism says it. David says that God turned his mourning into dancing by putting off his sackcloth and girding or dressing him with gladness. What a picture! God himself took off David's clothes of grief and heaviness, reassured him of his favor, and clothed him with new clothes of joy and gladness, and in so doing, transformed David's life of mourning into a life of dancing. The dancing parallels the girded me with gladness, and the mourning parallels the put off my sackcloth. Did God literally do these things to David? No, God did not literally take off one set of clothes and dress David in another. Can a person be physically clothed with gladness? Of course not. Even the phrase, mourning into dancing, is not a literal one. And yet, God did really do in David's heart what these phrases pictured him as doing. In reassuring him of his favor, God removed David's heaviness of heart and replaced it with joy and gratitude. Therefore, we see in Psalms 30.11 how God takes customs of the ancient Israelites and uses them to reveal truths both they and we can understand and experience. We no longer wear sackcloth when we are grieving, but we know very well the point that God is making here. We, as believers in Jesus, have experienced this psalm in our own Christian lives. Now, how does all this help us to interpret Psalms 149 verse 3 and Psalms 150 verse 4, where it says to praise God with a timbrel or tambourine and dancing? Must these verses be taken in a literal sense in order to be taken seriously? In other words, is God commanding the church that until the end of time we should praise him in worship by dancing with tambourines and the other instruments mentioned in Psalms 150? Of course not. Why? Because these poetic verses mean much more than that. To interpret the poetry of these psalms literally is to completely miss the point of the psalms. Every word of the psalms must be taken truly, but not necessarily literally. The imagery, hyperbole, and parallelisms of this poetry must be taken into consideration, and we must be able to see through the Hebrew cultural customs and practices to the message of each psalm. God spoke to his people in terms that they understood, such as the imagery that arose from that culture. Thus, much of the imagery of the Psalter is foreign to us in our modern culture. Second, we must ask how the first readers of the Psalms would have understood the imagery. In the Hebrew custom, they wore sackcloth when showing sorrow and conviction of sin. But that doesn't mean that we today must wear sackcloth in prayer when we feel under conviction of sin. Rather, we should feel the intensity of the conviction of sin and be moved by it to repentance. And remember what I said earlier? Right between those verses are the following verses in Psalms 149, verses 6 through 9. Let the high praises of God be in their mouth and a two-edged sword in their hand to execute vengeance upon the heathen and punishments upon the people, to bind their kings with chains and their nobles with fetters of iron, to execute upon them the judgment written, This honor have all his saints. Praise ye the Lord. If anyone tells you the selected verses in Psalms 149 verse 3 and 150 verse 4 are to be taken literally, then ask them, why they are not following through with these verses that tell them it's their duty to execute vengeance on their government officials. Hopefully they will get the point that these verses are to be ta- are not to be taken literally. This is the problem with many critics or unbelievers of the Bible. They will take things from the Bible as literal when they were never intended to be interpreted that way. Let's look at some of the verses in Jeremiah 31, 1-13 now. At the same time, saith the Lord, I will be the God of all the families of Israel, and they shall be my people. Verse 4, 
Again I will build thee, and thou shalt be rebuilt, O virgin of Israel. Thou shalt again be adorned with thy tabrets, and shalt go forth in the dances of them that make merry. Verse 5. Thou shalt yet plant vines upon the mountains of Samaria. Verse 11. For the Lord hath redeemed Jacob, and ransomed him from the hand of him that was stronger than he. Verse 12. Therefore they shall come and sing in the height of Zion and shall flow together to the goodness of the Lord, for wheat, and for wine, and for oil, and for the young of the flock, and of the herd. And their soul shall be as a watered garden, and they shall not sorrow any more at all. Verse 13. Then shall the virgin rejoice in the dance, both young men and old together. For I will turn their mourning into joy, and will comfort them, and make them rejoice from their sorrow. Here we see the power and beauty of imagery. Jeremiah 31 is a messianic prophecy. Most specifically, we see in Hebrews 8.8 8 and 10.16 that it's a prophecy of blessings and promises and effects of the new covenant in Jesus Christ. In Jeremiah 31, we see God will return to his people in Jesus Christ, and all of life will be renewed for them, from worship to agriculture. In verses 8-10, through 10, God will once again gather and rebuild his church from Jews and Gentiles. In verses 11 to 14, we see that by the sacrifice of Christ, God will redeem or ransom his people from their sins. And in Christ, he will pour out abundant bounty on his people. In the future, from Jeremiah's perspective, God's people would be characterized not by apostasy, but by gratitude and praise to God for the joyous experience of his abundant bounty to them in Christ. Their rich and full lives under God's blessing would be like a watered garden. The totality of their days would be spent in the celebration of goodness and grace of God shown them in Christ. God would turn their mourning into gladness and their grief into joy. In prophesying these things, Jeremiah used idiom and imagery that Israel of his day understood, for his prophecy was not only for our benefit, but for the people of his day as well. By his preaching, he was endeavoring to lead the people to repentance, by reminding them what they used to be, what they are during his days, and what they will be some day in Christ. Therefore, although every word of this prophecy of the new covenant and its blessings has come true, or will come true in Christ and his church, Nevertheless, that does not mean that every word is to be interpreted literally. Why? Because the New Testament does not interpret all of these prophecies literally. For example, according to Jeremiah 31.31, 31, the new covenant in Christ is made with the house of Israel and the house of Judah. But in the New Testament, in Hebrews chapters 10, 8, also 8 and 12, it applies to the church, comprised of both Jews and Gentiles. Furthermore, we must not miss all the imagery in Jeremiah 31. The new Israel is spoken of as a virgin in verse 4. The new Israel, or Christ's church, will rejoice in Christ. But our text is not to be interpreted that throughout history in every area of the globe where the church exists, Christians will be dancing, whirling, and leaping in Near Eastern fashion with tambourines. If we interpret this passage literally, and not as poetry, which it is, then we must believe that this prophecy of the new covenant is fulfilled only when virgins are dancing with tambourines with young and old men, verse 13, and Christians are planting vineyards on the hills of Samaria, verse 5, and when watchmen on the hills of Ephraim shall call out, Arise and let us go up to Zion, verse 6, and more importantly, the text, if interpreted literally, applies the blessings of the new covenant only to ethnic Israel. In other words, the actual literal remnant of Israel and not to God's people today. It is on this kind of literal interpretation of the Psalms and other parts of the Bible that we see new forms of worship coming into the church. However, to interpret literally these prof poetic prophecies, which were written in the idiom and imagery of ancient Israel, is to force an unbiblical hermeneutic upon the word of God and to misinterpret them.
the literary form of the text is what helps us determine the way in which we interpret the text. So then, should we be dancing before the Lord in our public worship services? If the interpretations I've given are correct, then the answer is obviously no. We must be more than superficial readers of God's word. 2 Timothy 2.15 tells us to study to show thyself approved unto God, a workman that needeth not be ashamed, rightly dividing the word of truth. May God bless you as you study his word.